Hello, so welcome to the MA Illustration and Visual Media Online Open Day. Um, we are doing the virtual version of this. It's always slightly different for me each time, but it's exciting to be able to deliver this to those of you who maybe couldn't come along in person or for whatever reason would like to come and listen to it again. I'm going to introduce you to a couple of folk that are here with me today. Um, but also give you a kind of a round idea of the course. And we're also going to open up questions at the end. So if there's anything that you would like me to kind of go back to or anything I haven't covered, then of course, feel free to ask your questions then. My name is Juliet Sugg. I'm the course leader for MA Illustration and Visual Media. And joining me today, you, you might not see them yet, but you'll hear her voice, is the lovely Harriet, who is our second year lead. Are you there, Harriet? I certainly am. And hopefully, yeah, I think you can see me as well. So very nice to see you all. And thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Harriet. And we've also got Amisha, who's actually one of our current first year students who can tell you very much the kind of real story of the student experience. Um, Amisha, do you want to just say hi? Hello. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Thank you. All right, so just a few kind of technical things about the um, about the sort of online nature of what we're doing. So as I said, if you have any questions, please do write them in the question box. There's the lovely Miranda who's here to help field them. And also, as I say, if you'd rather work asking in person or there's something that comes up toward the end, feel free to do so there. All of your audio is currently on mute. So <laughs> don't be worried if you sort of go to ask something and nobody responds. We can open those mics up again, I believe, toward the end, but it's just while I'm presenting that they're turned off. Just to make you all aware as well, this session is being recorded. Um, it's hosted by the LCC YouTube channel and it's also posted to our website. Um, which can be quite handy because I know often with these talks lots of information is thrown at you but actually being able to remember everything can be tricky so hopefully that's a, a way for you to go back and revisit it if you need to. Um, as I say there are other members of staff and one of our students in the session and although their audio is muted at times you should be able to hear them just like you did just now when I called them in. Okay. So, MA Illustration and Visual Media. So, our course, I think, is a little bit different. We have this slightly complicated title, Illustration and Visual Media. And the reason I'm very proud of it, and the reason it's a bit different, is we have this sort of very open space in terms of definitions and what that can mean. And the course really looks at providing a critical space in which we can kind of challenge or investigate perhaps some of those traditional definitions of what we think about when we think about illustration. Sometimes it can be deconstructed or even kind of reconfigured to be something that becomes different perhaps to what we've expected. So our graduates, I'll talk about what they do in the future in a little while, but there's a huge kind of array of things that they do after they leave us. And it's, interestingly, it might not be similar to each other. <laughs> We're not just sort of getting lots of illustrators that go out there and become commercial illustrators. Some do, some go into other kind of areas within art and design, and some sort of straddle lots of different spheres. We do not believe that illustration is a philosophy or practice of self-contained discipline in the contemporary visual world. Now that's lots of words, but what we mean by that is we simply like looking at the idea that rather than being put into a certain box, perhaps as we used to, i.e. I am just an illustrator, people within the course are able to say, sometimes I might do illustration work, sometimes I might work as a fine artist, sometimes those things come together, Sometimes I might be a graphic designer or an art critic or a curator. We're really interested in how we can kind of become authors of our own work and therefore not be so reliant on having to get someone else to give us a job, but actually to be able to chase work that we feel is appropriate for us. So we look at the idea of work that exists both offline, so real physical work, and also online, depending on what your practice is about. We're doing lots of work around the idea of social media, for example, and what that means for those of us working in the creative industries. Oh, technical problem, there we go. And incidentally, all of the work that you're seeing on screen is made by our students. And what I hope 
that you sort of get from that is the real sort of genuine diversity of work that we have on the course. We're very proud of the fact that there isn't just one house style. So perhaps unlike what sort of courses used to be back in the day, we're not looking for everybody to make one particular thing or to look identical. What we're really interested in is this idea of figuring out what you do, what's unique about you, and how can we set you up to kind of grab the career that's best for you. So what we're really doing is we're trying to help position you with a critical understanding of your work. So meaning what's your work about? What's important to you? What do you want to achieve within your career? but also giving you that kind of extra skill at thinking at a postgraduate level, which really does incorporate research. And we're very keen on the course that research isn't just the books that we read, the theory that we read, the things that we look at that might inspire us. It's also the work itself. So the example, and Misha will have heard this a few times, the example I always give to my students is, even if I wanted to learn how to draw a horse, if I drew that horse every single day, for a year, and I just use a pencil, by the end of the year, not only would I be much, much better at drawing that horse, I also will have began to master the pencil and master what happens when I look at that horse. So it's a very simple metaphor, but the idea is that the practical work we do is also research, and it also contributes to a kind of mastership of the tools that we're using. So, well, should you take a place on the course, you'd be looking at generating a body of self-authored work, and that's quite important. This is where I think sometimes our students ask, what's the difference between what we do at LCC and, say, Camberwell, who also do an MA in illustration? So Camberwell's MA in illustration, it's a fantastic course, but it's much more traditional. So, for example, whereas at Camberwell, you might have a very set brief, I don't know, um, create a book cover for this particular book. We ask every single project that you do to be self-authored, which means that essentially, although there are some restrictions, there are some sort of things that we're asking you to bring to that particular unit, you are deciding what your project is going to be and what it's going to be about. And I think that's really important for students that are thinking about applying, because it's just considering, is that of interest to you? Or actually, are you somebody that prefers the more traditional approach? It would be silly if we did the same thing. So that's very much the kind of difference in terms of Camberwell versus um, LCC. So throughout the course, not only will you be kind of extending and mastering your kind of practical process, you'll also be asked to do some reflective writing. And that writing isn't just so that we can kind of test you, but it's also to help you, again, understand more and more how to position your work in a critical context. The idea being then that if you wanted to apply for funding, if you wanted to apply for a place in an exhibition, if you wanted to continue your academic study of illustration and visual media, you have the ability to do that. So we're really keen on getting you to be working at quite a high level of research and being able to kind of accumulate all of that into what we call a final major project and thesis. And this is where you've got two sort of halves of the same project one half of which is you looking at making something practical and the other half of which is about you writing a thesis that is connected in some way to that project. So the thesis is not there to kind of trip you up, it's actually there to support the work that you're doing and to feed um, whatever kind of thought and research is going into that project. So who studies MA illustration and visual media? What's the kind of folk that we get? So applicants are expected to have an honours degree. So most of our applicants will have some kind of BA degree, uh, normally in something illustration or arts related. So, for example, sometimes we might get architecture students or fine artists um, or even graphic designers. Or it could be that it's somebody that's had lots of experience, you know, perhaps they've kind of not actually had a degree, but they've been working within the arts for some time. So whoever those people are, they're the kind of people that we're looking for. And again, the thing that's most important to us really is that portfolio. If we see something in your applica application that we feel is, is exciting and relevant for the kind of work that we do, then we're going to be interested in you. And you might have a very different background to the person sitting next to you, but that's what's kind of exciting to us. 
So what do we mean, and I've said it a few times, this idea of master's level study? So this is where we kind of perhaps get you to level up, almost like a computer game, from your BA to master's. And we do this through lots of kind of, I would say, self-reflection, analysis, and also feeding ourselves with relevant kind of discussion around illustration and visual media. So it's through things like reading groups, seminars, lectures, lots of practical workshops, and you're kind of, all of your staff, and this is quite important to me actually, and quite thrilling, all of your staff are practitioners, okay? So nobody is just a lecturer or just a teacher. They are all kind of functioning and practicing within their own art. And that means they're able to kind of lead you into hopefully creating something that's meaningful to you. We also have lots of guest artists come in and we're all here to kind of help you identify what those key ideas are through your work and how you can kind of relate them to history and culture, how you can locate your own practice within this kind of big contemporary world. Because actually I think that's the key to success at graduation is being able to identify, you know what, these are the kind of people that I belong to. These are the people who make similar work that I do, and these are the discussions, groups, organisations that I'm going to really enjoy working with. So the course introduces you to a community of people and facilities and materials, events, opportunities that allow you to really think about enhancing your career potential. It gives you the idea to look at what the expectations are at working at postgraduate level and even where that will take you beyond that into your career. We try and really figure out what's your potential, what's the thing, the golden thing that you do that we can kind of extract and take further. And that's, you know, something that some students go on to get so passionate about they end up going to do PhDs. And um, we've got a number of students from our year that have just passed. And that's quite thrilling to us because it means that the students are really engaged with the subject that they're looking at and they want to take it further. So it's not a, a prerequisite. We don't expect everyone to go on and do PhDs. But if it's something you are interested in, we have got that sort of channel open for some students. Your learning experience. So the university has been really proactive in responding to government guidelines. We're pretty much in a good safe area now, I think, but obviously it wasn't that long before we were all experiencing COVID. But the university is very good at kind of responding to those and finding a way to allow your studies to continue as safely as possible. And that's in regards to everything, um, you know, in terms of fire safety, technology safety, in terms of your workshops, etc. And what you get on the course is a mix of kind of on campus, so face to face teaching and a very small amount of online activity. And the online activity tends to be supplementary classes. So that might be, for example, language development or for those of you that don't speak English or it could be for um, academic support or it could be one to one tutorials if you would rather not come into uni and you'd rather see your tutor um, online. But most, I would say, the bulk of your course happens face to face. Now, this I always think looks completely confusing, but this is actually a kind of snapshot of the structure of the course. And what this is, this is your whole kind of year and three months, which is the length of the course. And then each of these strange kind of coloured looking blocks or lines are the units that you have to do in order to pass the course. So there's actually four units that you have to pass. So you do get graded on them, but the grade in no way affects your final qualification. All you need to do is to pass them. And then when you get to this very, very long pink one here that you can see goes on for a tremendously long amount of time. It starts sort of about midway through um, your, your summer term. There's this big summer holiday break in the middle, although much of that will be students writing their thesis and continuing their research for their FMP. And then you get this kind of about eight week period of just sort of finalizing your final major project before it accumulates in a show at the end. And this is where your final grade will be based on. So although you only have to pass each of these units, the actual grade that you achieve is based only on that final unit. 
And the reason we do that, there is a method <laughs> to our madness, is that we like you to be able to explore new potential, um, new ways of working without the pressure of thinking, this is gonna result in my final grade. So you've got these sort of four units that allow you to kind of practice almost what it is that you want to do and discover until you get to this much more crucial point at the end of doing your final major projects and thesis. And the first one, the green, this is what we call the emergent image. And that's the very first unit that you do when you start with us. This is what lovely Amisha has just finished up, which she's gonna talk a little bit about at the end of the program. Um, and with the emergent image, again, it's self-authored, but you've got to kind of work I would say through quite a long period. You can see that it starts in the first term and is actually handed in about three weeks into the second term. So you're, ex you're sort of extending quite a long period where you're just practically exploring a subject in some way. Now, alongside it, you have what we call a critical report. And that's where we're asking you to write a kind of ongoing self-analysis, both of your own research and of kind of research practices you've discovered that might inspire you. So this could be other artists, for example, or other ways of working. And the reason we do those in the first term is we're kind of using them to get you to think about, well, what does research mean to me? Is my process different from those around me? Is there new ways of working that I haven't thought about that I can start to use? It's really just kind of going deep into this idea in the hopes that once you've kind of got this under your belt, by the time we get to these longer units, you're able to be quite confident with what research means to you. This blue unit is one that I always love. This is the collaborative unit. And this is where we ask you to work either sort of with a group of people, or it could even be just one-on-one -on -one with one other person, or it could be an outside organization, event, community, something where you're really looking at what happens when you work, not just in kind of isolation, but in conjunction with something or someone else. And it's also a really good opportunity to get a little bit of professional experience there in terms of, well, if I am working outside of myself, what does that feel like? Do I enjoy it? Yeah, so it's kind of a nice little pause in between the bigger units just to experience this idea of collaboration. You then go on to what's called the authored image, which is this orange chunk. And this is where we get you to do a sort of dummy run, a sort of practice run for your final major project and thesis. And again, it's sort of a dummy run on purpose. Lots of students might begin doing something here. And by the time they get to this point, they realize actually their work might be slightly more focused than they thought, or it might move into a slightly different area, or it might just be a lovely kind of continuation of a lot of the work that you've done within the authored image. So it's kind of a practice run. And then, as I say, we move into finer major projects and thesis. And this is where we're really looking at you developing a body of work that you want to put out there, that you want to attract other people to come and hire you for or for you to kind of showcase simply what you do in order to be paid to continue doing that. And it's, it's not that long, actually. Our thesis is 5,000 words, and that might sound quite a lot, but actually when you break that down, as I always say to students, the introduction, if that takes about 1,000 words and the evaluation takes about 1,000 words, then you're only looking at about three chapters. So if you write them as kind of small essays, it's not a huge amount of work. However, sometimes I believe that writing things with less words can be harder, actually, interestingly, because you have to be quite focused and succinct with those words. But we're very much here to kind of help you through that. And if you choose something that you're genuinely interested in and that you're making practical work about in your FMP, then that should hopefully come quite naturally because all of that lovely thought and research kind of becomes a foundation for the practical work that you're doing. Facilities, this is the lovely one. So one of the things I always feel like I can say completely with confidence is that LCC has an incredible range of facilities and workshops available to you. So there's the 3D workshop where you can look at kind of making things practically, physically. Creative Technology Lab, that's where you can look at things like coding, AR, VR. Um, canteen and typo cafe, so your normal kind of food uh, requirements are taken care of. 
college shop. So you've actually got somewhere on, you know, on in the university, less than five minutes from your workshops where you can check in and kind of buy at a really good discount, actually, a number of materials and tools that you might want to use for your work. The digital space, which is this incredible um, sort of almost 24 hour, it's not 24 hour access, I shouldn't say that, but it does, it runs till quite late in the evening. And it's a space where you can either just sort of turn up, jump on a computer and start working, but you could also ask for help from the technicians for certain software. So let's say you're wanting to explore animation and you were a bit nervous about how to do, I don't know, many of the, you know, something like After Effects, you could just grab one of the technicians and they will literally sit down with you and help you to kind of do that. So it's a really um, phenomenal, actually, I would say, facility, that one. We have gallery spaces, so spaces where you can exhibit your, your work, and that's both internal and we're actually looking at some external spaces to do that at the moment. The kit room, which is somewhere where you can actually um, hire as a student technical kits that you might need for your projects, whether that be as simple as a camera or, I don't know, something more complicated than that. Um, an incredible library surface. So you have not only a brilliant library on site, so LCC, also as a UAL student, you are able to use any of the libraries um, in any of the UAL schools. And likewise, we can hire things in for you. So if there's something, I don't know, at Central St. Martins that you would really like to be able to read for your project or research, we can actually have that um, high, uh, delivered into the LCC library. Likewise, just as a UAL student, you get access to, I think, certain other libraries within institutions. You can even, I think, use the British Library if you go through a certain application process. So it's a great kind of uh, network, I would say, in terms of research. And it also includes lots of kind of digital things like um, journals that are online that you'd normally have to pay £75 for a year or a thing that Harriet and I love called Bob, which is, I think it's Box of British Broadcasting, which is a bit like a kind of a Netflix <laughs> that you get as a student with access to loads and loads of videos and film. We also have photography studios. LCC is quite famous for its photography um, facilities. Printing and finishing. So if you're looking at kind of making zines or making digital prints of things, we have that available. More traditional ways of printing, things like letterpress, screen printing, um, mono printing, etc. Quite an incredible array of um, availabilities there. And also the place, which is a kind of hub for students to look at putting on their own projects. So it's one of the nicest things about doing open days for me is being able to say to students, look at how much you actually <laughs> would have access to. The sky is the limit, I would say, in terms of what you might decide you want to make use of whilst you're here. Staff expertise. So as I said earlier, one of the things I'm really proud of with our course is that all of the staff are actively practicing artists, curators, writers, animators, illustrators who make uh, disseminate and discuss imaging so it's also quite important none of us just make you know we're all kind of like talking and being part of the community of what that work means so I'll take you through our staff this is me um, in a nutshell I'm really interested in kind of challenging the boundaries of illustration arts and the idea of stereotypes of feminine characters or protagonists within popular narrative and again, I'm somebody I think that, that fits this course <laughs> quite well because I'm interested in not only the sort of drawing, which is just the heart of it, but also things like performance, uh, sound design and, and what happens when all of these things mix. So I'm really interested in, I suppose, a sort of feminist underpinning this idea of what happens when you have to kind of confront the images that you're looking at rather than just be passive viewers. I've been commissioned for a few bits and pieces internationally and in the UK and I've been teaching scarily for about 15 years I think now so it's lovely to be able to kind of just focus down and work with the one course. You can always find out more about my work through the usual social media stuff and websites. We've got Harriet with us today. Harriet is our second year leader. Um, Harriet do you want to jump in and, and talk about your practice? I will jump in. Thank you so much Juliet. And um, as Juliet's described, this is um, a marvellous course. And in terms of our teaching, drawing from our experience, 
I'm somebody that has never really worked in one particular uh, medium or indeed box. So I was constantly jumping out of one and into another. And my current practice, as you can see here, this is an image from one of my prints. So I have a long established printmaking um, experience, but I'm currently working in film and working in conjunction with a performer, a dancer um, in a collaborative activity. So the, the way that my work tends to um, develop <clears throat> really depends um, on circumstance and indeed quite often on professional opportunities. And this is something that we also encourage in you as students. So we're, we're always sort of helping you and supporting you, we, we feel, in, in really looking at what the possibilities may be out there and how you can activate your work from that um, chance and activity. So my my work um, follows very much um, in kind from what Juliet's mentioned actually in this idea of a very specific lens and I think that the feminist lens for me as well as um, a queer lens is a key area of activity and understanding and I, I think about um, the way that we have been represented in terms of our gender, the fluidity and the spaces that we occupy, of course, are uh, very much a transparent skin. It's kind of what the print's about. So that's kind of part of my experience. And I, I think the other thing I'd mention is that I'm a curator as well um, as exhibiting. And I've had the opportunity of working in different residencies, both here and in Europe, uh, Germany, Greece, and Italy. I think these things as well as living in other places for a longer time. I know many people watching today are not necessarily going to be from London and I think this is a very important aspect of our course. We have an incredible kind of onus and perspective in terms of internationalism so it's really thinking about the way that we express through different languages, through different articulations and iterations as well. Um, that's it for me. Thank you, Harry. Harry, I might jump on you for a few others as well, if you don't mind, at, at different times. Yeah, happily. Shall I take the baton on? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, please do. Um, yeah, maybe if we sort of ping pong, so I'll, I'll talk you through one staff member and then Harriet can talk yeah. you through the next. Um, so this is this is Yim Yao. She's our first year lead. And again, Yim Yao is somebody, I suppose, much like Harriet and myself, who likes to play with these kind of definitions of what you can do with the illustrative image. Um, she's an artist working with embroidery, drawing, illustration, video, even some kind of documentary type approaches. And she really likes to investigate the role of drawing um, as a way to look at kind of satire. And what's really interesting about what she does is it has this sort of charm and this humor and is very sort of cute in many ways, but it also has a really serious underpinning, which at the moment she's really interested in the idea of Brexit um, and being able to use her satire to create conversation and political kind of change um, and even some kind of controversial discussion within that. So again, she's somebody who not only has this really interesting um, sort of underpinning of what the work is about, she also has a really explorative way of thinking about making images and drawing in particular. So she's really exciting, I think, as somebody who can be a good, uh, good ear and a good kind of voice for the kind of work that perhaps our students are making. Harry, are you okay to have a go at saying Damien? <laughs> Yes, certainly. And Damien, likewise. So Damien um, Roach, he's a London-based artist, a researcher, prolific researcher and educator. So he teaches in a number of different institutes. He's an associate lecturer, which gives him the opportunity of really working with a guest lecturer across um, the board. And um, this brings with it as well a very interesting conversation. So he will be working, for example, in a number of different higher educational institutes, as well as one of our key uh, members of staff at MAIVM. So very, very important this to have lots of different understandings of the different activity going on across uh, educational um, contexts in, in London. 
Um, he works under various projects um, across fine art, design and creative direction, as well as publishing. Uh, but Damien is actually quite a prolific sound artist as well, and very heavily involved with working with music, um, live music, and um, very much in a sort of performative sense as well as audiovisual. And his recent projects include a high-tech immersive performance at London's ICA, and the Tate Modern AV installations at Sonic Arts in Amsterdam, and then London Tender Pixel Design. For, and he works, you know, as a um, very much kind of a, a somebody who's producing to a brief for clients ranging from Caribou to Disney. So, you know, you can hear from that kind of profile as well, the kind of broad spectrum of activity that um, all of us have working with commercial clients and working very much with our own authored activity as well in terms of our, as artists. And um, he also has contributions to Sandberg Institute's Shadow Channel for MA programme as well. So that's um, Damien in a nutshell, but you'll find out more when you meet him. <laughs> Over to you. Thank you. We've also got Benjamin Murphy. Ben is an artist who um, not only kind of exhibits his own work internationally, he's also somebody who runs a, a sort of small independent gallery that's all about emergent artists. So he's really, uh, it's called Delphi and Gary Gallery, and he's really interested in sort of giving a, I suppose, a leg up to those who might just be at the beginning of their career and wanting to kind of find their way within the artwork. Um, he again teaches in a few different places. He's also a playwright and a writer and a poet, um, and is a great person to kind of look at in terms of entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, being able to generate your own work. Yeah, how to kind of create your own work, your own um, financial kind of success through things like social media. So yeah, really good kind of assets, I think, for graduating students. Harriet, I might give you the next one again. So Josh. So Josh um, Saunders, an associate lecturer, and Josh is an award-winning artist and filmmaker. Um, he um, makes extensive, in fact, he's currently in production as well for a film which has been commissioned by the British Film Institute, and his current awards, or his, his awards in the past, uh, 2017 Royal Television Society for Student Award, and that's a postgraduate animation that he got while still in college, amazing. And then 2015, the Royal College of Art Drawing Prize, and um, that was awarded by the great Quentin Blake. And he's been nominated for the 2018, was nominated for the 2018 British uh, Animation Awards and People Choice Awards. Uh, as well as the best poster in BFI selection. And um, the BFI selection is a short film selection that happens annually, then he was selected for the spring 2018. Um, and I think that Josh is an, another member of staff, which shows you the kind of the hybridity. Um, Amisha will know very well, our current student, that we are currently um, working in partnership with the BFI, alongside working with a 2D, 3D digital film. So you get the idea of the broad kind of delivery of your, um, your tuition at the course. A very good example as well. Thank you, Harriet. And this is Alice, Alice Wilson. You'd be working probably directly with Alice and the collaborative unit. Um, she's another artist who works in a variety of mediums, so everything from drawing to painting, photography, lots of sculptural work, and often sort of, you know, what it means when you bring this work together. Um, she's really interested in the kind of participatory process of, um, of art, so what it means when you're sort of negotiating, you're working with either a particular place or people or both that kind of inhabit that place. She's really good at things like residency, spends a lot of her time um, being able to kind of go and work intensively in, in certain places and organizations to think about creating work. Um, and is someone that, again, has exhibited, you know, to very high caliber, both internationally and within the UK. So a fab person to be working with. Uh, Harriet, James? So James, um, you'll be meeting regularly as well as both part of the collaborative unit with Alice. Um, he also works very interestingly across highly sort of digi digital and specialised platforms. He is one of our in-house digital specialists alongside the great kind of technician and digital team within UAL LCC. 
uh, James works um, uh, quite extensively with our students in as they enter towards the end of the course um, with sort of weekly check-ins as websites and um, highly sort of specialized digital content starts becoming very pressing as one-to-one -one tutorials that we offer with James and James himself um, is um, a, you know a fine artist working uh, in London and he really um, works particularly in the boundaries of curation as well as his own practice he is a curator he's run and organized a number of different shows with a wide range of um, artists I think he's very interested in the lines and crossovers between the digital and the human, shall we call it. Um, something about this, this kind of area of interaction. So very interesting artist. And he's currently working on his PhD. So he's not bad to talk to for a little bit of sort of research activity as well. Thank you, Harriet. Emily, another associate lecturer. So Emily Woolley is again, another award-winning um, artist who specializes in sculpture and 3D and she again is very interested in the relationship between 2D and 3D so for anybody that's interested in work that maybe isn't just a kind of you know static image but actually comes off of the screen or is a physical thing um, she's a great person to kind of work with to have that three-dimensional knowledge um, she likes to look at the idea of coexisting themes of endurance vulnerability surrounding the female body so what's really exciting about her work is rather than using literal female bodies she kind of makes these sculptures so that we can project our idea of the female body onto them so she's really interested in again i would say some kind of feminist undertones but also in the kind of medium um, of the idea of a sculpture as well. Uh, Harriet, Chris. And Chris, so Chris um, is a fine artist, but a, a very, very experienced graphic designer and works on live commissions. He trained as a fine artist originally. He still very much works with print as one of his main forms of activity. And he has undertaken a number and continues to undertake a number of commissions in terms of um, graphic output. Uh, with a heavy focus on silk, silk screen and you'll see that he's got his um, studio link there as well. So Garaudio Studiage is uh, his website. Thank you Harriet. And Patricia, so Patricia sort of specialises mainly I would say in sort of uh, painting and in printmaking. Uh, has been working as a lecturer for some time and again she has this sort of interesting um, relationship with the image where it's thinking about that kind of crossover from digital to real to political to kind of imaginative so she's got this kind of all around uh, experience of what it means to jump between some of those definitions really exciting member of staff thank you harry i might pull you in at another point but i will i will carry on for now so I've talked a little bit about the collaborative unit, okay, so which is something we do built into the course, but there's also lots of collaborative opportunities that we give you as sort of optional um, bolt-ons throughout the course. So to give you a few examples, in fact, actually, Harriet, you've been running lots of the collaboration projects. Maybe you'd be really good to talk about things that we're doing yeah, at the moment. Happy. <clears throat> yeah, happy. So, I mean, I, th I think that there's a strong emphasis at LCC on social justice and across UAL indeed, but particularly with LCC. And I think that MAIVM, uh, the last year, Juliet and I have really focused on making live projects one of the key activities within the course. So we've had um, some really great opportunities to work with, for example, um, Radiate Windrush, which is a Afro-Caribbean culturally focused uh, community festival run annually at um, Walworth Park, Burgess Park in Walworth, just down the road. And Wendy Cummin came in and gave us a fantastic brief, a, really a focus on the idea of the spoken word and students participated both um, in the brief and they were able to also exhibit their work as part of the festival and on the website, which was fantastic. We've worked with Oasis Academy School. Um, that's a big kind of national organization that started in Southwark. Actually, the original school hub is still based at Waterloo and students worked with me over 
a four-day period across a couple of weekends and we developed a fantastic project working with their nurture um, kind of special unit for uh, young people and children a really exciting project which many of the students at the IVM found really um, both exhilarating but also inspiring for thinking about the potential of how art is transformative for communities and the impact that we can have as practitioners um, and we have a very exciting partnership with Paris Nanterre the university in Paris. Um, we've had students and uh, invited members of staff over in January. Amisha, you, you know you met some of our Paris uh, friends and we will have been indeed undertaking a trip um, this year with our current cohort and this is seen as very much an ongoing collaboration. So we will be inviting and participating with um, the University in Paris um, as part of our kind of course field trip. And these are live research activities, very much thinking about the way that we use, for example, special collections. We were focusing, for example, this year with Stanley Kubrick Special Archive, which is based at LCC. Remarkably, we're very lucky to have it on site. Um, we also worked with the BFI Rubin Library and Media Tech, and we will be likewise visiting the Cinematic in Paris, as well as the La Contemporaine, which is an amazing kind of collection of art based within the University of Paris Nanterre. So it's really kind of thinking about the way we as researchers take information and how we can draw information into our practice. Thank you, Harriet. So kind of continuing from there, we do like to think about how we can be connected to the industry. That's to give you some experience, but also to kind of allow you to hear from professionals, you know, their experience, their advice, what they did to make their careers work. So we have a host of kind of guest speakers coming in as part of the course. And as, uh, yeah, as Harriet kind of discussed there, lots of opportunities to think about how you could then use this for either collaborative projects or even things that are across the whole of the postgraduate community. So something that I think is great about UAL, if you think about how many postgraduate students we have, you're not restricted to just you know, the course itself. There's a, a beautiful hub which allows you to kind of connect with all sorts of other people that are studying at postgraduate level. And that can be really useful. So for example, uh, if you were looking at kind of wanting to have somebody who's a sound designer, but it's not your skill set work with an animation that you're making you could reach out on the postgrad hub to find us out somebody that is a you know to sound designer and create some kind of work with them or it could be about your research you know there's some particular topic that you're looking at as an illustrator and there's somebody i don't know within ual that's looking at it as a designer what happens when you have those conversations together so you've really got this connection, sort of both ends, I suppose, of a career trajectory, both at the very beginning and also those people that have gone on to kind of create work and, and careers for themselves that are really valuable for you in terms of experience. So I've talked a lot about research. I won't kind of keep banging on about it, but I think that's a key part to what it means to be a postgrad student. You're not just making work without thinking about it. You know, and I think that research, it shouldn't be something you see as as a chore. It should be something that is really feeding you and exciting you and remembering that you can kind of use all of the stuff that we have available through UAL in order to help you get to a point where you feel quite confident with that work is part of what it means to be that postgraduate student. Um, so this is, I think, always a really good example. I love to show Ala. She's a student who, for the first three kind of uh, units, was kind of getting Bs, B pluses, but she was never quite satisfied with her work. And then COVID hit. And this was, a, as I'm sure lots of you experienced, a really tricky time. She was living in halls, you know, in this tiny little room, just having to make work where she was and how she could. And she ended up making this incredible project, which really kind of deconstructed, I suppose, the power of certain uh, artists that we think of as being historically magnificent. So she was looking at Picasso, but actually with a very critical eye, both in terms of his treatments of people of colour and also women. And she ended up building this extraordinary set in which 
she well the idea was that people from the outside could come and sit within the set and make themselves the muse the muse in the painting um, but because of covid she had to kind of reconstruct it with herself within it now based on this project and the reason i like to to bring her up on the open day it was so sort of uh, engaging and so well received both within the university and externally she ended up being granted what's called a global visa talent uh, sorry a global talent visa which meant that she could continue studying in in the uk with kind of financial support and extending that visa status so the reason i talk about that is if you're really connected and passionate and driven about the work that you make on the course you can absolutely use it as a kind of footing to continue your career we try to kind of make, look at the work you make, not just as something that exists on its own, but something that's becoming part of your practice and a means for you to think about what you're going to do next and how you can make it work. So there really are, I can't say this more, no expectations of particular style or way of working. You will have seen, we've got everything. And, and again, that's why our staff work in so many different kind of areas from graphic design, traditional illustration, performance, sculpture, video making, sound work, community-based projects. It's not about there being one way of doing it. It's about your kind of rigor and ability to keep going at whatever it is that you do really well. So we expect you to develop your own visual voice and that's sort of in conjunction with whatever it is that excites you so that you eventually become really confident about its place in the world and where you want to take it. Juliet, just to mention, I'm so sorry to interrupt, we've got some fantastic questions I've just seen and we also need to squeeze in a little bit of time just to, to mention. So we, we are very aware, everybody, that you've got lots of questions and we will endeavour to answer as many as we can at the end of the session and we're indeed going to try and squeeze in the rest of our presentation. We only have a short period of time. So just to mention, thank you. Thanks, Harriet. Um, so in terms of our graduates, what do they do? <laughs> our graduates go on to work in all sorts of different areas. Some might become freelance artists, image makers, illustrators. Some go on just to look at how to work in all of those areas, how to take on commissions or how to apply for an exhibition. Some go on to PhD level or even become really interested in things like curation, critical writing, working within muse museums and galleries. So there's a whole kind of array of different ways that people work on the course. And again, I think that comes out from the fact that we have such kind of open-mindedness about what you can get from the course. It's not about just being one particular thing. I mentioned the postgraduate hub already, so I won't talk to you more about there. But again, it's kind of just reminding you that you do have this wonderful kind of opportunity as a UAL student to reach out, not just within your course, but also beyond that. And to look at how you can use things like our careers and employment services to get advice to help you whilst you're a student on how you might want to go on um, to kind of carve out your career as you go. We've also got the brilliant LCC Accelerate, which is specifically designed for postgraduate students. And it's there for you, again, to kind of get advice, get professional guidance, and look at kind of the ways that successful industry entrepreneurs have made this work in the past. Um, it's a program that enables you to accelerate your ideas and to strengthen your expertise as creative entrepreneur. So you might have an idea about what you want to do, but of course, making that work and really knowing how to start with that is incredibly difficult. And so you've got LCC Accelerate there as a kind of a, a hub to be able to test those ideas and, and really get a lot of help and help to think about how to get them going. And what I'm really impressed by with this program is that it goes three years beyond your graduation. So obviously for our students that have just graduated, they're, they're just kind of figuring things out. It probably will be one or two years down the line when they really start to sharpen their idea of what they want to do and they still have access to Accelerate. So they're able to still kind of book an appointment and work with our services here to get help on how to do that. So you're not kind of a student that's just told, right, you know, you're in and you're out and we don't want to work with you anymore. You're very much part of a kind of UAR relationship which is there as another source if you should want to use it to help you keep building your careers. 
industry mentoring scheme. So in a similar way, if you are interested in kind of having a little bit of guidance and help, there is a scheme through the postgraduate service that allows you to think about working with different disciplines and industry professionals to support your development as you enter the creative industries. Okay. So in terms of applying, Harriet, would you be able just to jump in briefly for me here? I most definitely will. Thank you. So we've got um, some clear criteria that we'd like you to take note of and please do go to the um, MA application page. It's the best place to look at um, in terms of your uh, application requirements. So to make an application for MA um, IVM, you're going to need personal details, your current and previous education and qualification, employment history, CV, personal statement, in the form of a short video this is specifically to become uh, to make the kind of application uh, procedure a little bit more accessible for some of you who will find it much easier talking about work your portfolio and your study proposal i think the key thing to remember in your personal statement which is the recorded version is that you really focus on your current activity and it is really useful to talk about your current practice perhaps a key area of your portfolio that you'd like to focus on so we really are thinking about the people and the way that you're articulating about your work. We want you to be um, straightforward and natural, please. Just talk honestly about the way you work and why. That's what we want to hear. Um, application deadline, um, the current deadlines here, uh, but I, I think the best thing would be to look at um, the how to apply link and then remember that UAL applications are the main key area where you'll be able to get all your current information. So application um, resources there. Okay, back Thank over to you, Julia. Thank you very much, Harriet. Yeah, apologies. The um, <laughs> the deadlines I've realised that are still on the presentation are from last year, but you should be able to see them up on the website, and Miranda can help you there if you're unsure. So the big question we often get from students is what goes into the portfolio? What are we sort of asking for in terms of, um, yeah, in terms of the applications? So the portfolio, most importantly, should show ambition, okay? So show us what you wanna do if you get a place on the course. What's your idea? What ambitions do you have? Even if they feel sort of, you know, out of reach at the moment. Really importantly, show your curiosity Show us what it is that you're intrigued about, even if you don't have all the answers yet. We're looking for experimentation and a passion for image making. So something that I find quite interesting is a lot of the applications I'm receiving, the images can be quite minimal and there's lots of kind of text and data and research. And it's almost like people want to prove that their work is important or to kind of oversell because they're unconfident. When it comes to the portfolio, we want to see your passion for making, whatever that might be. So it's really important that you allow that portfolio to stand nice and proud and confident and have lots of those kind of um, images just on their own. Your work must be technically strong. So we are looking for, you know, a certain kind of aesthetic accomplishment and importantly, a prioritizing over thinking so that you are really thinking about the making as the predominant thing. You should show that you can take risks and that you can make work led by your own interests and or beliefs. So we're not going to tell you what to make and it has to be about you telling us and writing your own kind of briefs that will inspire you. We don't work on a commercial brief, so you need to show us work that comes from a trust in yourself in order to be able to sustain a unique self-directed practice. So that's not to say that you can't explore commercial work, but the point is we're not going to say to you, or it's not sort of okay to say, well, I'm just gonna do the penguin brief. You know, it has to be something that is somehow connected to you. If you wanted to do the penguin brief, you would have to kind of write a little bit about why that's important to you, how that's connected to your practice, and actually, you know, what it can do for you in terms of your ambition. You should include a minimum of about five projects or a series of works, 
and altogether that should be a maximum of about 20 images. And the big thing I always say is it's very much quality, not quantity. So think about it as a kind of edited overview of the work that you make. Then you've got the study proposal. Now, lots of people panic about that. What you actually uh, give us in terms of a proposal, you're not locked in stone with that. You know, lots of people change that proposal once it comes to sort of final major project time. But what it does do is it shows us that you have interesting ideas. It shows us that you are self-authored, meaning you're able to generate a body of work or some briefs that, that are coming from you without us telling you what that needs to be. We, of course, help you, but we do want you to be the driving force behind what you do. What do you want to make work about while you're with us? So again, just thinking, well, what's important to me? As simple as that, that allows us to kind of have an insight into the kind of work you're interested in. We expect that your proposal will develop and change when you are on MAIBM, but we want to see experimental and challenging starting points. So it's really an opportunity just for us to see behind the scenes and get an idea of, you know, if you were to join the course, what's the way that you think? What's the kind of work you'd be interested in making? There's also a video task that we ask you to do, and I know that that can be a bit kind of spooky for some people, but actually it really helps us with the applications be able to get a sense of who you are. And you can be very creative with that in terms of create, curating um, a sort of, you know, a video that's almost a little bit of a mini documentary. It's very short, it's only about a minute long, but allows us to see, you know, what makes you, you? How are you different? Why are you interesting? What do you love about making and talking about images? And what do you like about the sound of our course? So really important to us, why do you want to do our course? Because that shows us how well you understand what we do and will help us to go, okay, well, this student really seems to get what we do. So it makes sense for them to have a place on the course. Yeah, it's really important, that last one. Scholarships and funding. Now, I don't know a great deal about this, but I know that there are some things that are available to you. So again, you can check out any of your kind of eligi uh, <laughs> uh, eligibility. <laughs> it's, it's getting late in the day. My ability to form words is, is getting harder and harder via the website. But there are things like the postgraduate master's loan, um, UL, UK postgraduate scholarships, international postgraduate scholarships. Um, and the ISH Accommodation Award. So again, Miranda might be able to signpost you with sort of more than I can offer here, but it is worth looking at if you're someone that's worrying about the kind of financial cost of doing the MA. And we have arrived at the end. Thank you very much. So I think, how are we doing for time, Miranda and Harriet? Have we got time to quickly show both Samira's video and Amisha's um, talk about her work? Um, shall we just to um, keep the time, should we just show Amisha's and then um, because uh, Samira's video is available on our YouTube, if you do want to catch it and I will pop it in the chat as well. So, yeah, if you show Amisha's video, that would be great. OK, let me just bring up Amisha. And just to announce everybody that it's the 3rd of April, that will be the last round application deadline for this year. Um, so just to clarify. 3rd of April. Superstar. Thank you, Harriet. Now, I can't see my screen when I share. So can everybody now see Amisha's absolutely brilliant uh, blog? Oh, we could see oh, it. It did. Now disappeared. <laughs> there, there we go. <laughs> Amazing. So what I will do, Amisha, if you want to kind of talk about your work and then just tell me when you want me to scroll down or hit play. How does that sound? Yeah, sure. Uh, so this was basically my first emergent image project that Julia just mentioned about. And um, in this project, what I was sort of exploring is um, how I can find presence and mindfulness sort of through my art practice. And um, because this was a long project, it had like a variety of kind of body of work within it. Um, uh, yeah, you can scroll down now. So it's it's basically divided in four stages. The first one speaks about the fears of moving to a new country and you know stepping into a very uncomfortable zone. And 
uh, how the reality looks dark and grim when you're sort of um, scared. And um, the one thing that, again, uh, Juliet mentioned about is the print facilities in the college. So I just, I really wanted to make the most of all possible uh, print techniques. So the first one I used here was in Taglio, and I would definitely recommend uh, people to try it out. <laughs> um, then uh, the second stage. Uh, this one is about how um, it's about I escape is the second stage. It's about finding like an escape mechanism to just avoid your fears rather than dealing with them. And um, since this was a very reflective project, my first um, form of um, escape mechanisms were video games. So I've tried mm -hmm. to sort of replicate like a small animation that sort of looks like retro video games as the final outcome. Can I play? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, you can pause it. it, it just goes on in a loop. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the third stage is called I see, and it's about finally starting to realize um, these sort of preconceived notions I built for myself and um, just sort of understanding that reality can be, um, you know, slightly better when you're not scared um, and just, you know, reflecting on all your toxic patterns in a way. And here what I wanted to experiment with is just how perspective when drawn digitally sort of interacts when you put it in uh, a particular space. In this case, the first one is like a corner and the second one is like the edge where the floor and the wall meet. Um, so these are more to be looked in person, but um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, these are just the digital versions of it. Um, and the fourth one is called I Stay. It's about finally sort of finding a sense of belonging in a new city and just understanding that um, reality is a lot better when you're less scared. Um, and it's it's about how you sort of perceive it at the end of the day. Um, and yeah, I so I spent the entire term in the digital labs just learning um, this 3D software and I, just to sort of make this one last artwork. Um, yeah, that's okay. about it. <laughs>
And um, these are just uh, a bunch of rough explorations that didn't make it to the final stage, but uh, they were sort of helpful in terms of figuring out those four final stages. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Amisha. Thank you. Thank Thank you, really appreciate that. And I should say as well, this is literally Amisha's kind of first practical project where she's been exploring all sorts of different techniques. And it's actually really nice, I think, to be able to see some of the, the background stuff that's going on there as well. And the fact that you've never done sort of 3D software before and were able to achieve that. So fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. We've shared your website link, Amisha, to the guests oh, today. Thank you. <laughs> Sure, I get a proper kind of replay of the videos too, which don't always work so well on these platforms. Fantastic. Okay, so if I stop sharing, I'm hoping nothing's going to suddenly explode. Um, hopefully, then, yeah, we're able to kind of answer any questions that you might have. Oh, Harriet, you're all in the dark there. That was a <laughs> an illuminating moment. Um, and obviously, Amish is here as well. So if you want to sort of have, uh, you know, the truth from the students, then then she's very kindly here to answer any questions. Is that Miranda, is there anything I can pick up on the chat at all? Um, yeah, well, I can definitely work our way through. We've got quite a lot of questions, so please do bear with us. Um, um, so uh, this person asks the difference between this course and actually the graphic media design course. Is there sort of any insight you can give there? Yeah, absolutely. We're very different. <laughs> we're very, very different. Um, we're not a graphic design course. We're very much interested in the idea of this sort of straddling relationship between illustration and fine art. So design is not something that is huge or paramount to the, the work that we do. Um, we're sort of, I mean, Harriet and I joke all the time, but we're the sort of slightly... <laughs> slightly odd ones in the school you know we're the ones that um, are a lot more kind of playful I think in many respects we're we're not people that work to design to design briefs which I think a lot of LCC is about so yeah I mean I think we're I think we're very different if you look at the kind of course content and structure mm. they're very, very different in terms of what we deliver would, would you agree Harriet? Yeah I think it's a really interesting question actually and it's a very good point but I think let's not get too kind of um, vague about this. It's not to say that we don't produce practitioners that are very able to work to a brief. And this is a very different, you know, differentiation. So I think, Amisha, um, it'd be even worth kind of your reflection on this. I don't know how you found it in your first year. It would be a good, good, uh, you know, did you have a similar expectation? Were you surprised? What, what do you think? Um, so honestly, what the course I thought was just um, like a very holistic view on illustration itself. So it has a lot more to, to do with just image making rather than graphic design, I feel. Um, and there are a few students who are really good at graphic design and that sort of adds to their work. But it's still, I feel a lot more about um, the image making bit. And like Great. you say, Juliet, isn't it? It's going beyond the boundaries of what's expected, which is very much an industry requirement now. You know, industry, they want people that will be able to give a brief and more. And so this is this is something else I think is worth saying. It's not to say that we don't work in conjunction with or we're not aware of the employment 
implications for you as you leave as graduates. We are very keen to enhance your professional status and activity, but it is going beyond what perhaps some boxes have got written on them. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. I would also say, um, so uh, a good point of, uh, sort of first point of, of looking at these things is to look at our, the different course pages and sort of to compare there and also uh, the other online open days that we have. So unfortunately, the graphic and media design session is going on at this very minute, uh, but you will be able to catch up on it in the same way that you're able to catch up on this. So if you go on our YouTube channel in a couple of weeks, it should be ready for you and you can sort of compare and contrast there as well. Lovely, okay, next question. Um, so this is quite an interesting one and maybe you could speak a little bit more broadly and branch out from this about what to include in your portfolio, but um, they ask, would you encourage feminist or political works in student portfolios when applying? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if it feels appropriate to your work, um, obviously if it doesn't, then, then don't feel like you have to sort of make it about something that it's not. But we are, of course, you know, as Harriet said, that are, are driven by the idea of exploring things um, in a sort of a way that feels quite current. So we get all sorts of things, queer studies, uh, feminism, political, you know, we are about sometimes making work that perhaps is uncomfortable um, or raises difficult conversations. I think we're, we're not interested in decoration. That's the easiest way I can say it. I think perhaps the commercial side of things is a, is a different different point almost. What we're interested in is work that wants to do something that has a voice. And I think that can be everything from something that is quite um, strong, like a sort of feminist underpinning, to something that might just be about wanting to create conversation around, you know, something that's, that people feel is lacking in society. We've had great projects about things like kindness, uh, mental health problems, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, absolutely. Do, do not be afraid of having a voice. We would welcome that within the application. Great, thank you. Next question. Um, I've never had a formal background in illustration and arts, but I have a keen interest in it. How important is it for potential students to already know how to draw or have a personal style when they apply for this course? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I would say we are definitely looking for a certain standard uh, of work. However, if there is something of a sort of potential in your application, so maybe you, you don't have that sort of sophisticated drawing skill yet, but there is something in that work that is really exciting to us, or something about the way you're talking, something about the areas of work that you're interested in, we might equally be just as excited about having you in there. And I. I think it's really important that not all of the students on our on our course are drawers. You know, it's not an expectation that you need to draw. We have mm. people doing performance, sound, um, almost kind of textual based things. So if the course is interesting to you and you can make a convincing enough argument as to why you think it's the right fit, we're probably going to be really excited because, as Amisha said, having different people with different approaches is actually what makes the course interesting, I think. I mean, I'll just add, and I think it's quite, it's worth, because it's almost linking to the last question. After all, your portfolio is a story of you and a very strong story that you're presenting. So, I mean, as long as it's a genuine exploration of how you are relating to specific themes and environments, contemporary themes and environments, that is the world right now. So I think that that can come in many different forms, performative, photo photographic. There are many different ways that you will respond and engage um, visually. Um, so it really isn't just about the pen and paper. <laughs> Great, I'm thank sorry. you. There was a very strange bird in my garden. I don't know if you can hear it, but it's making an incredible yeah. noise. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we can't hear it, but <laughs> I didn't want to say anything, but I could. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got my bird hearing up. Yet, <laughs> That'll be an extra bonus point for any participants that can identify that noise. Okay? <laughs> yeah. you drop in the chat. Moving you on. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> um, next question then. Um, again, again, portfolio related. Um, and maybe Amisha, you could give a little bit of um, guidance on this because it's sort of the way that you presented your work in the web page we viewed. But 
um, they asked, since there is a limit for the portfolio, would you suggest to put different steps of the project on the same page since it would not be enough to only include the final result? Yeah, I think that's a really clever way of doing it. So some students will will kind of, yeah, be quite creative about what one image is. So I think it's always important that you allow some of those images to just be on their own and confident and big and bold. But as you can see, actually, Amisha did a really nice um, example of that in some of the work that she was sewing, where you might see the sketchbook open next to another development, or you might see kind of variations of the same thing. It's all about showing us that kind of edited journey of your project. So yeah, I think if it feels like it's useful, if it feels like things are being lost, then maybe that's not a good idea. But if it's just a couple of places where you want to show more than one part of something, I think that's really smart. Great, next question then. Um, and again, maybe you could talk a little bit about this as well, but um, should I know the subject of my final project while applying to the course or can I decide it on the way? Brilliant question. Amisha, I'd be really curious to hear your thoughts on this one. I think um, probably... Honestly, I still don't know what I'm gonna do for my final major project, but I think I'm getting there um, with every project, I'm getting closer to finding it out. So. I don't think you should know that. Uh, it's completely okay, I guess. <laughs> Thanks, Amisha. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that, um, as I say, students worry every year when it comes to application time. They almost seem to sort of say, oh, I need to nail exactly what my project is about in the application, and then I'll just follow that through. Um, I would say maybe one in 10 people are able to do that. Uh, by the nature of any course, the moment you're given kind of space and time to start studying, your brain will do all of these wonderful things. And uh, most people end up having to go through that process quite a long time before they get to the point where they can really settle on a final major project. So don't panic if you're not sure. It's more a case of showing us that you have interesting thoughts and ideas. Maybe you don't know what you're going to do with them yet, but you're showing us that you have that kind of... Um, curiosity and ambition would you agree Harriet yeah exactly it's that where am I right now story built up and evidencing all the skills and all the knowledge that you've built up right to now so so that what where am I now of course we never know what the future holds and all sorts of interesting 90 degree and 360 degree uh, turns can happen but I think that sense of genuine statement that is a really important thing in a portfolio you're not trying to be somebody else you are who you are that's what stands out when we go through the very many applications we receive it's really important to have clarity of vision so really don't be afraid to tell us you know really tell us think about how you tell us and um, that is enough Great, thank you. Yes, um, I, I can see a lot of the questions are about uh, portfolios. Um, you can see a lot more information um, on our YouTube channel and also on our the UAL website, which I think I have already dropped in the chat. Uh, so please do check those out because they have a lot more kind of in-depth information that kind of give you an idea of like crafting narrative. But if you have much more in-depth details, uh, questions that you want to ask, I would advise uh, emailing our admissions team because they can really give you that kind of bespoke information lovely okay let's have a look next question um yeah Julia, you br briefly touched on this maybe you could go on a bit more detail could you describe the difference of this program with the one delivered at camberwell i have the utmost respect for what they do at camberwell it's a brilliant course but it's a very different course and the difference i think is is Sort of primarily to do with the tradition of illustration and I always sort of say to students I think what your job is as a, as a sort of budding illustrator is to figure out what do I like doing am I someone who's a bit of a puzzle solver and actually I like working with something else and then I have to kind of solve that problem for somebody else or am I somebody who actually kind of the work arrives from me and I create the puzzle and I want to solve my own puzzle. With Camberwell, it's that more traditional approach. So you will be looking at traditional ideas around illustration, editorial, fashion, storytelling, you know, not that any of these things we don't do, we welcome that stuff as well, but we ask you to drive it. So we don't say to you, 
this has got to be a book cover about this book and it needs to be done in six weeks or this has to be an image for a chocolate box and it needs to be done in three weeks what we do is we say hey look at this interesting thing what do you think about it and how would you make work in response to it so we're much more what i would call self-authored i know it's a bit of a kind of a complex thing and it's also a little bit to do with the medium you know as i say we have students on our course who you might not call an illustrator you might think, well, they're an actor, or they are um, a sound artist, or they are a critical thinker, a researcher. We have a real sort of mix of approaches. And I think for us in particular, we have this thing where our students are not sort of locked into one thing. They might do a bit of design here, and then it's fine art, and then they do an illustration. And then they're actually, I don't know, creating a show about something. So we're asking for a certain kind of um challenge and sort of sophisticated way of thinking about the art industry which perhaps is less traditional so i wouldn't you know both courses are excellent but they do very different things i hope that makes sense i know it's slightly sort of abstract do, do you agree harriet do you think that's a good way of yeah, putting I think, it i think you've put it beautifully julia and i think also after all you know in today's contemporary environment in terms of what's facing graduates you as graduates finishing the the course um you you need to be dexterous you need to really think about as we said earlier how do i apply myself to this possibility how can i potentially respond to something um driven by your ethical and aesthetic drives you know these are what define us so we we think of it really as you said Juliet, very much that you know you are the author of your story and you're taking that and then finding those opportunities and finding how you can potentially respond so these are open-ended outcomes this is really i think where we're quite unique actually not just compared to camberwell but um really in terms of the uk based courses i think this is a very specific um activity that we do in rma that's that's what i would say thank you right next last couple of questions now um how many students are there in each intake so we normally try and cap the number anywhere between about 25 maximum 35 i think this year we've got 35 bang on um we once had a huge year we've just graduated with a student a year of 65 but that was mainly down to covid we had lots of students that were referring because understandably they, they decided not to study whilst covid was still happening which meant we had a bit of a sort of double intake but it's quite important to us that we make sure the course is, is relatively small um i think on ma's no matter what the subject it's really important that you have quite an intimate relationship both with each other and with your tutors and once you're working with a tutor group there's only about seven people in that group so everything is is making sure that you're heard basically and that you have the ability to kind of contribute and be seen so it's a relatively small one in light of ual numbers i would say great thank you next question um does ual support the alumni to find a job yeah, I'm really astounded by, and I don't think many of the students know this or actually make the most of it. Um, when I was at art school, you were just kind of thrown out there, weren't you, Harriet? Just, you know, yeah. go and work. Whereas now, you know, even if you've only just been with us for a couple of months, there's um, a careers and employability service. There's um, Accelerate, which is about when you graduate. There's things like CV drop-ins, portfolio reviews. So sort of if you wanted to make a portfolio, start taking it out there. Uh, there's peer mentoring. There's a great deal of consistent support that goes not only through your time with us, but also <clears throat> graduate. So it's something I feel sort of quite excited about in terms of the industry, sorry, the university being able to support you. And we're also really keen on you starting to make some of those links whilst you're studying with us. So a lot of the work that Harriet's doing is about kind of getting students experience in a way that they might be able to continue or take further from their from their graduation. Do, do you agree, Harriet? 
Yeah, and I think it doesn't, it again, tie to the previous question, which is really important, because it's where do you make your opportunities? You know, how are you going to make and find your opportunities? It's one of the key activities of artists and practitioners in society is looking for opportunities, finding ways that you can frame your own um, potential uh, projects, really, to propose, you know, to invent yourself that road. So th this is really part of what we're talking about. And I think that MAIVM is uniquely positioned to discuss this idea of resilience uh, in career building, which is a very important factor. But like you say, Juliet, I mean, the brilliant thing about UAL is this is massive machine, I hope you won't mind me calling it that, that straddles you know, all of these institutions across London. So we do have an amazing infrastructure to be able to support graduates in a very significant way, you know, with bespoke, dedicated departments that are really thinking about you after you leave. I think what I would say though is a sort of bit of a caveat to that is you need to be proactive so we're not going to just give you those links and those opportunities we'll offer them to you and the school and the institution offers it to you but I think you do need to be quite yeah you need to be quite proactive about taking those opportunities even if you're not sure what it means so it might mean you know taking up some of those two hour courses on how to write a cv or how to make a covering letter but we are very much there to kind of help you and signpost you to that stuff if it's what you're interested in uh, i'd also like to add the careers and employability page is super helpful um, just to find part-time jobs when you're a student as well as um after you graduate fantastic great. great um the final question um which is quite a good one does media in the course title uh mean that the course is ideal for people with a moving image or animation background <laughs> that's a good question we're a bit sneaky with the word media <laughs> media means anything right so if you are someone that makes moving image, we're certainly opening that door for you. I mean, Harriet herself makes a lot of moving image. Lots of our tutors are into moving image. I do a little bit of it myself. So it's certainly something that we welcome. Media in terms of the title just refers to everything. You know, that could equally be photograph or performance or sound. But I think that just be aware that we're not an animation course. So we wouldn't necessarily have the same expertise that say MA animation could give you in terms of software and really thinking about specifically animation but if you are interested in moving image I definitely think we've got the kind of core support there to help you do that and again the facilities at LCC which would help you achieve that so yeah again Harriet and Amisha just do you sort of think I, am I telling the truth there yeah um I think, I mean, there are, I am personally exploring animation for my current collaborative unit. Um, so I think it's, it's more about what you just want to do with the course, but it's not specifically asking you to do animation each time. Absolutely. Perfectly said, Amisha. <laughs> with most of our points, it's a case of, well, how do you want to answer it? You know, with the brief, what do you want to do? Mm. Some that might be a static drawing for other people that might be a sculpture for someone else that might be a moving image we're never going to say no there's always going to be an excitement as long as you feel excited about what you do great yes that person says uh, they have an animation background and would like to upskill in illustration and image making so oh, fabulous and it sounds oh, like yeah. you'd be an absolute asset mm -hmm. for us yeah definitely mm -hmm. Great. Well, then, in that case, um, that brings us to the end of our questions. Um, hopefully, I got through them all. There are a lot of questions, which is great. If we didn't, um, please do get in touch with um, any of the email addresses on the slide um, and or get in touch with, I will drop my email address also in the chat as well, if you have anything, and I can always signpost you. Um, but before we finish, um, is there anything, Juliet, Harriet, Amisha, that you'd like to say? Any sort of words of wisdom? I'm going to pass the baton on to the others while I have a think. <laughs> well, it, it's a tremendously exciting point, isn't it? The threshold of application is all about potential and possibility. Um, it can be very nerve wracking. I, I always like to say just focus on your true story. <laughs> 
the one story that you can talk about, which is you, that's the best story. It's good enough. So I think that's always my word. Don't try to be something you're not. Don't try to be somebody else you're not. Don't try to imitate anybody else. Just be yourself and be clear about the way you communicate that story in your portfolio. That's the key for the application. And that includes, of course, a possibility to narrate and use your own voice, a very unique part of the application process at UEL that we allow and we take very careful note of the way you talk about your work. So that's what I would say. I don't know what you want to add, Manisha. You've gone through that process recently, haven't you? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think for me it was um, just like the abundance of uh, knowledge and re resources this course has to offer. It's it's like you're put in an all-you-can-eat buffet and then you just need like a very, very big appetite for knowledge and you just need to work on building this appetite for knowledge. So I think this course is a lot... Um, you get what you put in, I feel. So the more you put in, the more you get out of it. Oh, Misha, that was useful. I might use that as a soundbite. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think those are both kind of real pearls of wisdom. And um, I suppose I would just echo again, both Misha and Harriet, in terms of, I always say to students, have a look at the work that other students have done. So look at our Instagram, look at our show reels. Um, and just think, am I applying because of the name? Or am I applying because I think I'm really suited for this course? Because that's really, that's what it's about. I think sometimes students get attracted to the name or the institution more than, is this the right fit for me? Which is why I was really impressed with the, you know, what's the difference between Camberwell question. So my big piece of advice is if it does feel like the right fit for you, then just as Harriet says, be yourself. Tell us why you are exciting and interesting. Don't try and be anything else nine times out of ten those are the ones that really sparkle for us so yeah that's my final word <laughs> that's great thank you so much uh you three and thank you for everyone at home joining as well um, <laughs> and thank you for all your questions um i will now uh, uh, end the session thank you very much everyone thank you bye, -bye. bye everybody